the one who walks alongside flame. The Sword of Night and Flame was the original overpowered weapon in Elden Ring. As soon as it was discovered on original patch, it immediately became the weapon of choice for meme runs, challenge runs, and was used in some of the earliest speedrun routes. While it isn't quite as powerful now as it was back then, it's still very strong and undeniably one of the coolest weapons that From Software has ever given us, which made it the easy choice for my first in faith build. Thanks for being patient over the last month while I made the move to PC, but now I'm all set up, let's get back to it. Hey guys, Thingfishy here, and welcome to build guide number 24. Now, In Faith is one of the more interesting builds in the game, and it can be quite awkward to set up. While I won't be focusing too much on spells in this run, I am going to show you a cool way of getting set up for that if you want to. And I'll definitely be doing In Faith spells only in the future. So to get set up for this run, I followed my standard setup guide. Link to the full video and play along in the description. If you want to use sorceries, you need the smithing stones as well. If you're going melee, you only need the sombers. So we pick up the action here at the purified ruins in Liurnia. Run down into the basement to grab the two finger heirloom. Now to Weeping Peninsula. Drop down the cliffs next to the Church of Inhibition to grab the Faith Tier. Then head to Eiji and jump down the cliffs nearby and head north to grab the Intelligence Tier. Now up to the Erdtree Gazing Hill, past the Wyndham Ruins and all the way round Volcano Manor to Fort Lyde. Up to the top to grab the Fire Scorpion Charm. Now head to the Bridge of Iniquity and across the battlefield to grab Golden Vow. Then to the outer wall Phantom Tree Grace and ride southeast to grab the Golden Order Seal from the Church on the Hill. Then back to Leonia and into Caria Manor. Up to the lower level and then from that Grace follow this route to grab our main weapon for the run. Then make your way to Caled, first to Fort Gale, ride round the back of the building to grab Flame Grammy strength. Then on to Lena's Rise, jump onto the side of the bridge to bait the Knight's Cavalry into yeeting himself off. Yes, this still works on 109. Now head to Fort Farrath 
to kill Grail with the Morning Star and the Bleed Grease, using a foul foot as she dies. Then to the Rockview balcony, Grace, and towards the minor Ur tree. We're here to kill the Avatar for the flame shrouding tier. He's really not a problem with this weapon. And for the final part of our setup, head south from the third church of Marika. Grab the spike crack tier by the minor Ur tree, then to the Mistwood ruins for the St. Trina's lilies and the axe talisman. Then to the lift and down into the Black Reach. Ride to the Siofa Riverbank and head northeast from the Grace until you get to this broken pillar. Use the teleporter on top, then ride round the edge of the cliffs to grab Marika's scar seal from under the waterfall. Now it's time for Margit. And we're super overpowered as usual, so two of the flame weapon arts will do it. Run through Stormvale, dodging all of the arrows perfectly. Before we head into Godric, go grab the crack pots from the Pot Boys. Now while you watch Godric get absolutely wrecked, let's talk about this weapon. It's two different weapon arts, scale with its two different stats. The Knight with Intelligence and the Flame with Faith. So the general idea for this build is to use our Physic and our Talismans to buff whichever attack we want to rely on for a specific fight. So you can kind of think of this sword as being two builds in one. Now for Rhea Lucaria and Red Wolf. As usual, wait for the jump and then go for your weapon arm. After that, we're gonna head across the Academy rooftops doing our best Boromir impression. All the way to this building, then jump down this scaffolding and kill this little crab for some jewel Burger King fashion. Excellent. Now back to Caria Manor. And you might be wondering why on earth we picked up the spike crack tier and the axe talisman for a Sword of Night and Flame build. And the reason is that the Stabbing R2 moveset is ridiculously good for dealing with Tree Sentinel and Loretta enemies. Parry into a Chargy, shuffle forward a few steps, then another Chargy. Now ride towards Rani's Rise, stopping off halfway to check out Celevis's creepy puppet dungeon. Speak to Rani and the boys, then head over to speak to Celevis. Now we need a couple of things for his quest line, so first head to the Castle Morn Rampart and jump up the Spirit Spring for some Starlight Shards, then to Argyle Lake South to do the same thing. Now to the highway junction and ride northeast to drop down into this little clearing and grab the amber star line. Then back to the round table. Give the potion to Gideon 
and fantasize about him drinking it. Then head back to Celebus. Now, I used to think that you had to buy all of his spells to advance his dialogue through here, but actually, you just have to reload the area twice when you run out of options. Exhaust all the dialogue to grab the magic scorpion charm. Now back to the minor Ur tree in Northwest Leonia to bully the tree avatar for the magic shrouding tip. Now back to the village of the Albanorix for some mushrooms and St. Trina's lilies. Then back to Carle at the Church of Ella for the crack pots and the crafting kit. Now we're going to head to Volcano Manor. And we're going to start using the other half of our weapon art here, the Comet Azure part. So swap over to the Magic Scorpion Charm, Maricus Scar Seal, and the Intelligence Physic. So, Godskin Noble with 13 Vigor. It sounds like a nightmare, right? Well, watch this. Now head through the dungeon to the Stone Sword Key Gate. Through and drop down to grab the Dagger Talisman. Then chuck a sleep pot on the floor instead of healing, panic, and jump off to your death. Head all the way down to the bottom to grab the Somber Seven by the Abductor. Now, why did we rush to Volcano Manor? Well, the answer is in this room. This enemy, who looks like a smooth dumpling with legs, drops the Gelmir Glintstone Staff, the best staff in the game for an Int Faith build on New Game, and the first one that you're gonna have access to on an Int Faith build. But, it's a 10% drop. So if you want it, you have to run through this whole dungeon, kill all the enemies in this room to attack him safely, then kill him to see if he drops the staff. In theory, do this 10 times and you'll get it. But anyone who's ever tried to platinum Dark Souls 3 knows exactly how soul destroying drop rates can be. It's our only option though, as the alternative is going straight to Radan, then fighting the gargoyles early. And you'd really have to hate farming to do that to yourself. So, Radon. Again, you might think this would be a nightmare with low vigor, but with this weapon, speak to our best mate. Now back to Leonia and down into the crater.
drop down to the Knight's Sacred Ground and grab the Finger Slayer Blade. Back to Rani, then head to East Leonia and right up to the top of the Karin Study Hall to grab the Stargazer Heirloom. Back to the Round Table to buy a Talisman Pouch for it. Then head into the Aqueduct for the Gargoyles. And again, you might think this would be an absolute nightmare, but watch this. Okay, so the good news is that the Knight Weapon Art will do half of their health bar. The bad news is that it's slow enough to get you in real trouble in this fight. So don't try to brute force it. Play this fight with normal melee attacks until you're sure you have enough time for the weapon art. It's not that bad, just don't get too greedy. Right through deep root depths, then up the branches to this tower. And finally, we have our in faith scaling staff for sorceries. Now all we need is a cool spell to cast with it. So head back to Volcano Manor for Rykard. Standard speedrun strats for this one. Put the lance in your right hand, serpent hunter in your left, then spam crouching pokes through both phases. Head back to the round table and use the runes from the setup to buy all of the smithing stones you need to upgrade the Prince of Death staff to plus 16. Then speak to Enya to buy Rykard's Rancor. Now this has been an extremely long setup, but we now have a mid-game Int Faith staff and a mid-game spell to cast with it. And the Draconic Tree Sentinel is about to find out exactly what we can do with that. Why do I play this game? Head through Langdale to the Avenue Balcony Grace. Now, if you're getting a little bored of your fashion at this point, you can ride west along the road from the Windmill Heights Grace until you see this fella on the hill. Aggro him and engage in an epic duel. Or just sneak up behind him and Comet Azure him for his threats. Now for Godfrey, and standard R1 strats here, but you can get a Comet Azure off on the jumping attack that he always does at the start of the fight, which obviously he won't do if you're trying to film a YouTube video. Now for Morgoth. At the start of the fight, 
go for standard melee attacks until you see him start the dagger attack. As soon as he does it, go for Comet Azure for an easy phase 1. For phase 2, do a Comet whenever you see one of the two blood attacks. Now up to the mountain tops, and we're going to head straight for Castle Soul here. And unfortunately for me, that means Ballistas. Uh, no, actually it's fine. We're all good. We're all good. Oh, fuck. After quite some time, make it up to this tower and drop down to look at the painting. Now we're going to ride up to the bridge near the Stargazer ruins to find this guy. We're here for the Great Hood. It's a fuck off hood, isn't it? Head back to Mount Gilmir and speak to Alexander in the lava. Now for the big man. And there isn't a lot to say about this one. Run through Farum, all the way to the Dragon Temple Transept Grace. Go in and put the duo to sleep. Same strat as Noble. Double Comet into Riposte, then more Comet. Then to the Stone Sword Key Gate, through it, and up to see our main man on the rooftop. Do a little sparring with him and take the shard he hands you while he tells you he's off to the DLC and he'll see us there. For the Draconic Sentinel, you can use the weapon art, or parries and charges. I went for a little mix of both. For Malaketh and Clergyman, there isn't really any fancy strats. I just went for standard melee strats for Beast, then for Malaketh, just punish that slow 1-2 combo with a weapon art for an easy fight.
run up to Gideon for a deeply satisfying revenge fight. Yeah, this is how it feels, you bastard. Now for Godfrey, go for exactly the same strats as before and use a weapon art on the stomp attack. This will build up posture damage for the Horolu fight. And for Horaloo. For Radagon, this weapon is a monster. Make sure that you refill your FP as soon as he jumps though, otherwise you'll get smashed in the face. For Elden Beast, just use the Comet weapon art in all of the openings. This will build up stagger damage throughout the fight. When you get a stagger, make sure you get two extra Comets in. Now back to Castle Soul for what is possibly the most satisfying start to this fight. For Nile, keep at a distance and dodge the electric foot or the small tornado, then do the weapon art just outside of his melee range. This is a super easy one. Now before we head to the snowfields, head back to Farron. For Plassey, Comet for the win. You can get three in between the lightning strikes at the start if you time it perfectly. For the rest of the fight, get them in whenever you can. Running to the back leg after his fire attacks is a great opportunity, as always. Head back to the second church of Marika to bully Eleonora for the purifying crystal tear. Then through the snowfields all the way to Ordener Town. Ride southwest from here, jump on this ledge to cheese the invader, then take the teleporter to Mogwin's palace for Moog. 
And this is a really easy fight with this weapon. Once again, we do enough damage to effectively stunlock his phase 1. It also does really good damage through knee hill, and you can even get a stagger at the start of phase 2. From here, a couple more attacks, and we're done. For the majority of Loretta's fight, I went for parries and charged attacks. But you can get weapon arts in every time you see one of those big blue attacks. Before the final fight, head back to the top of Carian Manor to grab Pidia's bell bearing and buy Carian retaliation. Pop whatever runes you need to get two more dex levels to use it with the buckler. Now as much as I'm enjoying the fashion, I now want to talk about light rolls. But I know what you're thinking and the answer is yes we can keep the hood. For Melania, you can get two back-to-back -back Comet Azures in, every time she either does the jump attack or you riposte her after a parry. Now, Light Rolls and Waterfowl. You might think that because Light Rolls got nerfed in 109 that the easy Waterfowl dodge is dead, but it's not. It's just a little more precise. You have to wait until Melania is right at the very top of her jump at the start before rolling back three times. You can use her left hand reaching its highest point as a good cue for this. And that's it, the Sword of Night and Flame. If you've enjoyed this video, give it a like, tell me what build you'd like to see next, and subscribe to my channel for more Elden Ring build guides. As always, thanks for watching, see you soon.